Welcome uh, to this webinar session, Civic Education and Civic Language, What Should We Say? We know it's a question and a topic on many people's minds, especially in a year like 2024. What are the words we can say? How do we think about that? How do we be understood? How do we understand each other? Um, we are very excited that this program is one of the featured programs of Civic Learning Week, and we also recognize it's landing on the Friday of Civic Learning Week, um, and that many of you have been in programs throughout the week. So we're really excited to kind of bring in the caboose for you um, and kind of, like I said, dig into a topic we know is on many people's minds. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to our promotional partner, USC Dornzeif, the Center for Political Future. I know many of you are here because of their encouragement that you attend the session. So just want to thank them and uh, the team there for helping get the word out on this event and this topic. Um, so let me introduce myself a little bit before we get going and pace. I know for many of you, this is maybe the first time you're engaging with our organization. Uh, my name is Amy McIsaac. I am the Managing Director of Learning and Experimentation at PACE. Um, I also help to lead this area of work for the organization. PACE itself is a nonprofit organization. We consider ourselves a philanthropic laboratory. We have 75 funding institutions, grant makers, who are our members. Um, and they range from you know, big foundations, small foundations, national in scope, regional in scope, you know, left, left of center, right of center, um, lots of different types. The thing they all have in common, however, is that they are in some way seeking to maximize their impact on democracy and civic life in America. So they all care about strengthening and advancing um, civic life and civic engagement. Um, we started as a philanthropy serving organization, that's that PSO acronym you see on your screen, almost 20 years ago. So we've been doing this work for almost 20 years, and we started the civic language work about five years ago. The research we're going to look at today is actually our third survey of the American public on their perceptions of civic language. Um, the reason we do this work uh, is because, frankly, it started from our members a couple years ago who were talking about sensing a disconnect between the words that they use and say and what they and what they hear the American public using and saying around civic activity, civic life, and democracy. Um, and so our first foray into this work five years ago was really to get some answers for our members. When they asked us, you know, where can we turn to understand where Americans are in civic language, we couldn't find a ton at the time. And so we really took on a survey ourselves. But over the last couple of years, not surprisingly, the chorus has become much larger than our members. Frankly, there's rarely a civic leader we talk to that's not in some way sharing this sort of sentiment, that the coded and loaded nature of civic terms has become untenable. Are there even words I can say anymore? And that might be a thought that you've had or you've said yourself. Um, we know how much words are stop being words and almost are becoming many signals, sometimes constructive, sometimes destructive, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional. And we're sending these many signals out to each other all the time. So how can we understand that better? That's the focus of this work. To give you a little context about where we are in our own process here, just so you can understand where this webinar is falling, we actually started this round of research back in the fall of 2023 when we started to design what we wanted this survey to do, what answer, what questions we had that we wanted the survey to help us answer. Um, we've been in strong partnership and collaboration with Citizen Data, which many of you know as one of the just a fantastic firm that does um, research on topics related to citizen life and civic life. So we partnered with them in 2021, repartnered with them in 2023. And many of you may have participated in an input survey at that time where we asked folks, what words do you want us to study? And we really designed the survey to help us get you the answers that you needed on that work. So we had the survey out in the field in November. I'll talk more about the survey in a minute. And when we got back from the holidays, we started to develop the tools that would bring this data to life and to you. And we started to look into the data for early findings. Um, one of the things that PACE takes really seriously is our commitment to learn alongside the field. And so we released our data last week. You may have been at the March 6th webinar where we 
unveiled our data and made it fully publicly available through an interactive dashboard and a whole bunch of other tools. Um, that is available for you on our website, pacefunders.org backslash language. We'll share more about that as we go, but that's a good page to have up, frankly, even during this webinar. Um, so that is in your hands and we, it's in our hands, meaning we haven't fully dug into it ourselves. That is the uh, flurry of activity we are in from now until the summer, where we are going into the data, trying to pull as much analysis on different cuts, webinar series, AI tool we're going to show you in a minute, different talks on the data. So we're kind of in this like flurry of activity phase with the hope and the goal of having a report of our findings and really the findings we can learn alongside you uh, published in the late summer, early fall with enough time before we get into that hardcore election season to hopefully be a resource for folks in that stretch. So that's just some context about where we are in the overall timeline. The other area of context I want to give you before we go into the data is about the survey itself. Um, I would recommend if it's Siri, if you didn't already put it in the chat, um, go to pacefunders.org backslash language. Um, there you can access the survey instrument itself through a PDF. So you can see exactly how the questions were sequenced and worded and what options people had. We'll do a lot of that in how we're presenting the analysis, but it's good to have that up also as we go. And in that survey instrument, you'll see that there were 49 total questions we asked. Again, we developed this all in partnership with Citizen Data. Um, we had 21 terms that we were trying to understand the perceptions of, and we clustered those terms in groups of seven. Each survey respondent got only a group of seven to respond to throughout the duration of their survey. That was to manage towards survey fatigue. And we clustered the words based on themes. So in the light purple box on the screen, you can see the words that we tested as well as how we um, categorized them. So one respondent only received the democracy cluster, for example, or the racial equity cluster. We also wanted to show you the identities and experiences we, we asked people in the survey. So some of like the key demographic questions around age and gender and race and ethnicity, political ideology and political party. Those are very large for our type of research. Um, many of your eyes might be drawn to the civic education line, which we're going to go into incredibly more, um, as well as civic actions and some civic belief questions around who do you think democracy is working for. If something in this middle category is bolded, it's because it is either an identity or a word that we retested from 2021 in this 2023 research. So those are the hooks to what we can see in terms of two snapshots in time. It's not true longitudinal data because it wasn't the exact same people in 21 and 23 who filled out our survey, but it is able to give us a good snapshot between two years of how different groups felt about words at different times. In this lower left-hand corner of this screen, wanted you to just see a sense of like the highest of high levels of the types of questions that were in the survey. Most of the data we'll look at revolves around that first category, around the impressions of the words. So people were asked, you know, for a word like democracy, are you positive, negative, neutral, or unfamiliar on that term? Um, we all also asked people, what is the term you're most positive about on your list? And what is the term you're most negative about on your list? And then they were served a certain number of reasons why that might be true. So we can start to understand why people feel and hold the perceptions they do about the words. Um, we also asked folks to tell us if a term they felt was meant for them or someone else. So we were able to get some peek inside people's degree of ownership around the words. Uh, is this term bring people together or do you perceive that it drives people apart? Again, giving us some insight into how people, how polarizing people perceive these terms to be. Um, does this term make you feel motivated to act? And we did associate each cluster with a, a thematically aligned action. So for example, people who got democracy cluster were asked, does this term make you feel motivated to vote? And people could give us a scale to very unmotivated to very motivated. So we, we were trying to understand something about what are these words doing in people's lives in terms of maybe connecting to behavior and action. And then really excitedly, though I will say we are not ready to share this data because we're still figuring out how we want to get into the analysis of this. We did have an open-ended question in the survey that asked people to describe how they understand one of three words. Uh, either democracy, civic engagement, or racial equity, depending on their cluster. And um, 
we have 5,000 Americans own words about how they define these terms, a huge treasure trove of um, analysis for us to dig into, which we we anticipate doing over the next couple of months. But just know that exists. And I think it's a really exciting place for us to put some energy as we continue to learn. Um, other quick stats, especially for my researchers on the call, you know, these are this is kind of the response of the survey we had uh the survey in the field for about three weeks uh in november of 2023 what's important to know about those dates is that it was exactly two years after the 2021 survey was in the field so we do have a really clean two-year look um we were shooting for an n of 5000 we got an n of 5033 so thank you to those 33 extra people that um told us how they felt we did filter on voter registration um I can get into more reasons why, but that was the right choice for this survey, and I and we'll talk more in a minute about that. We also wanted a nationally representative survey sample, so we waited on party ID, race, gender, and education, and the margin of error is one point plus or minus one point four percent. So, snapshot of the survey itself. I know that was kind of like eating our vegetables before we go into the dessert of the analysis, but I do think it's important to know that foundational stuff before before we dig in. Um, one other piece that I want to be really clear about is, um, you know, we did not, we cannot design a survey to do all things for all people. So before we go into the analysis, I just want to take a beat to share what we really did design the survey to do and what we designed the survey not to do. So again, we made the choice to have this survey um, get at people, Americans who are registered to vote. So the survey is not designed to tell us how Americans who are not registered to vote perceive terms. We are considering it as another sample size and another or another sample set for us. But for the purposes of what we're looking at today, I want to keep you, I want you to keep in mind these are registered voters who filled out our survey. The survey was also not designed to give us certainty about how people assess the concepts behind the terms. We know how people feel about terms from this work. We can make a logical you know, leap of, of faith here that people might feel positive towards the concept of democracy if they're positive on the term of democracy, for example. But I do want to hold that that line of connection was not the, the intentional design of the survey. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, we didn't design it to tell us if and how people use the terms in their lives, you know, where are these words showing up for folks and, and how are they actually employing them in their lives was not an area that we decided to put energy in this round. Um, we also don't know if people's impressions of the terms are based on their personal experience or of the ideal. So this will particularly come into play for a word like democracy, where it's like, are people positive on this word because of, the, of their experience of American democracy or because of what they imagine it could be, even if we haven't fulfilled that potential yet? And then most importantly, I think it's I want to note that the survey was not designed to establish cause and effect relationship. Um, this is particularly important when we look at attitudes and behavior. We can, of course, see correlation. You know, if somebody is positive on a word and we're also seeing it made them do X activity in the world, maybe that, you know, we can see a correlation there, but not a cause and effect. So we want to be careful about that line. But what was the survey designed to do after I just told you five things it wasn't designed to do? So we can know how American registered voters perceive terms. We can also compare how different groups, identity and experiences, like how those compare to each other. That's where we'll spend a lot of time today. Um, we did design the survey very deliberately to give us signals about why people hold, hold the perceptions they do. So we'll, we'll be getting a little bit into the why as well. Like I said, that definitional um, analysis is going to be really interesting. We're not ready with it today, but it was designed to give us some sense of like the words Americans use. And I will just put in a plug for my own little soapbox here in that I actually have a hypothesis after spending a couple of years looking at all this work that we're not living through a coded and loaded moment of civic language. Language. We're living through an evolution of civic language. And I think that definitional data, when we run the analysis on it, is going to be some of the keys and the insights into where is civic language actually moving and how do we support that evolution. And then most importantly on what the survey was designed to do for this webinar, I want you to know that the survey was actually intentionally designed to expand our understanding of the influence of civic education on our civic lives. In 2021's research, we saw how much the civic education community leaned on our research to do many things. 
make the case for investment, understand branding and communication, make the case for the impact civic education is playing in many parts of civic life. And we were so um, grateful our research was being leaned on in that way. And really, in a way, we didn't see other communities gravitating to it. So when we were looking at 2023's survey and thinking about what do we want the survey to do in that design phase, we're like, we really really want it to deliver for the civic education community because we know how much it had already delivered for this community. So please know that was an intentional part of the design of this survey that we have some real hooks into civic education that I think are going to give us some really helpful analysis. So that's all my context. Sorry, it was boring. Um, but our goals today is we want to share with you our learning about the 2023 perceptions, both at a high level. There's a couple national snapshots that we think are important for you to see. And we'll spend most of our time talking about how those um, the perceptions in civic education. Um, we also know that people don't want to just feel stuck in civic language. So we're experimenting with demoing a way um, forward on what to actually say. Uh, and so we have a tool that we've been employing in this phase of the project that my colleague Siri is going to share with you. Um, and so we'll we'll spend a little time figuring out what do I say now? And then we also want to make sure that you leave this webinar with tools to help you keep learning as well. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Reverend Dr. Siri Erickson, who has been my right-hand person through this whole journey. Um, and she's going to take you on a high-level tour of findings. So over to Siri. All right. Hello, everybody. We're going to take a look at four slides that give us just a sense at a very high level of some of the most important findings. And then Amy's going to take you into the civic ed specific findings. So the first snapshot that we want to show you is overall on the 21 terms, how are Americans perceiving these terms in 2023? So here you see the purple is the positive. Yellow is people who selected that they were not familiar with the term. Gray is people who selected neither. And then orange is the negative. And they're ordered from most positive to least positive. So you can see right at the top that freedom is the most positive term of the year. We did not test that one in 2021. So that jumped right to the top of our list. And it also has very low negatives. Um, you can kind of look at what's on here on your own. There's a few things I do want to point out. So it's not always the case that people are negative on a term or excuse me, positive, uh, not positive on a term because they're negative. Sometimes they're not positive because they're not familiar or they're just unsure. And so if we look at the very bottom of this chart, we see the term bridging, which we know is very popular and beloved in the field of civic engagement professionals right now. Um, not very positive though for Americans, but they're not negative about that term either. So even though it's at the bottom of our list of 21 terms in terms of positivity, we think there's a lot of opportunity still to help Americans understand this term, become more familiar with it, and you know maybe make it go up in, in positivity in years to come because there's not a lot of negativity. Uh, that is different, a different dynamic than what we might see kind of also towards the bottom, racial equity and social justice. Those two have the highest negativity of all of our 21 terms. So even though the majority of Americans, over 50%, are positive on racial equity and social justice, there are quite a few Americans who are also not neutral or not unfamiliar, but actually negative on those terms. So the headline, though, that we don't want to lose sight of as we go into a lot more detail about the data is that by and large Americans are positive on civic language. And we think that's an important headline not to lose sight of as we look deeper. The second snapshot that we have relates to those three clusters that Amy spoke to you about earlier. So we took the aggregate of each one in terms of positivity and compared across three clusters. 
And the democracy cluster has the highest positivity score of the three. Um, perhaps a little bit surprising to us, racial equity, the racial equity cluster had the second highest set of positive scores and the civic engagement cluster had the lowest. So that's just something to keep in mind also overall in terms of how these groups of terms are functioning and being perceived by American voters. The third snapshot we wanna show you relates to what Amy said about how we were able within each cluster to ask American voters, which of these seven terms are you the most positive on and why? And which of these seven are you the least positive on? And, or sorry, the, least, the most negative or least positive. Um, and the why is what's shown here. And we think that is really, really interesting. What I want to highlight for you today is that people on the positive side said what was influencing their perception of those terms is, number one, it is a term that aligns with their personal values. And number two, it makes them feel hopeful about the future. So those are the top two reasons people gave for their most positive term choice. But on the other side, on the most negative side, which is in the orange, the number one reason driving people's negative perceptions of terms is that they hear politicians speaking negatively about that term. That's the top reason. And then the second reason is parallel to what we saw on the positive. It's that people have a perception that the term is making them feel fearful about the future. So feelings about the future were the second choice, both on the positive and the negative. But the number one reason is quite different with politicians influencing the negative and alignment with personal values really influencing on the positive side. And then the final snapshot we wanna give you is a top line comparison between our 2021 data and our 2023 data. And I don't know what your first reaction is as you're looking at this, but I will tell you that we were surprised. <laughs> we were pretty surprised to see that of the 11 terms that we retested two years later, American voters have grown significantly more positive on nine of the 11 terms. The two outliers are unity and diversity, which we don't, they're with, they're, those two are both within the margin of error of difference. And so we're just kind of seeing those as they haven't moved to unity and diversity, but everything else Americans have gotten more positive on and in pretty significant ways. Uh, Americans grew by 20% in their positivity on a term like liberty. So we're still trying to get underneath why our survey doesn't really help us understand why Americans got more po positive. Um, these are not the same 5,000 people that we asked in 2021. And so that's something we would love to throw out to you all if, to see if you have any hypotheses or ideas, or if you're also seeing a trend in your work that this is resonating with. So that's something that we're going to keep exploring. And if you have a first instinct of like, oh, yes, that makes sense because of what, of what I'm seeing in my work, please feel free to put it into the chat because we would love to collect your thoughts and good ideas. But a big headline, in two years, Americans got more positive on civic terms. All right, Amy, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Siri. So yeah, so so that's some stage setting as we go now into the main show, uh, the, the cut of civic education. And we love doing these webinars because it gives us a reason and, an, and, a, and a motivation to go in and to look at our own data with a particular lens. Um, we, if you have the survey instrument up, um, I'm going to kind of tell you which questions we ended up really hooking into for this analysis. And the first one is question eight. 
There was a question that asked folks, did you take civics or American government classes in school? Please select all that apply, no, or unsure. So this is a select all that apply question. If you were with us in 2021 and 2022, this question may sound familiar. It is the same question we asked in 2021, but back then the answer options were yes, no, or unsure. What we did this year was to give us some granularity into um, different education, civic education experiences that people may have had. Um, and so what we see here in the top right graph, um, this is the breakdown of our survey population. Um, you know, we see most people had high school civics. Some people also had junior high and college. Um, very few people had civic ed as an adult through continuing education, and even fewer had civic ed in, in another setting outside of the classroom. 4% were unsure, and 14% said, no, I did not receive civic education. What I think is also interesting is if you look at the graph below, we wanted to understand, okay, so we see you know, these percentages based on the yeses and the nos, how many people had multiple civic ed experiences? And we see that most people, 52% had one, and, and it was mostly that high school experience. 20% uh, of, our, our, of our population had two, 9% had three, and very few, though some, had four or all five um, of the civic ed experiences. So that's some context I think important to know um, as we go into this data. Now, we could have gone in a million different ways with a lot of different questions. So we really had to make some decisions um, for what are, the, what are the ways we wanted to go into this analysis today. So here we go. The, the three areas we're gonna focus on. First, um, the impact of civic education on Americans embracing of civic terms. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We also wanted to go into the data about uh, to understand how young people perceive civic terms. We know a lot of folks who are in civic ed are thinking about particularly that younger group of, of Americans and how they're perceiving civic terms. So we wanted to give you a little bit of, um, of love on that. And then lastly, one of the questions we know people get is how do I know if civic ed is making a difference in what people then do? And so we looked at our data to, to see what the impact of civic education is on civic actions and beliefs. So let's go to this first area first. Um, I'm talking to a bunch of people who think about education. So I thought I would start with uh, the familiarity or the unfamiliarity ratings. So again, remember everyone was offered an option for each term that they received. Are you positive, negative, neutral, or unfamiliar on this term? And what we see here, and the orange dot is the are the people who said they did not receive civic education or were unsure. That's no. The people who have the purple dot are people who said one or more of the yes options in this question. And we see that people, first I take away, people are mostly familiar. There's very low unfamiliarity rates on the words overall, which I think is good news, right? Good job educators, you're doing it. People know what the words are. We see an outlier in bridging, which was also an outlier in some of the data theory showed us. We know bridging can be a bit of a jargony term. And so we see higher unfamiliarity with that term compared to other terms. I think it's worth noting. Um, and, you know, a lot of these terms, again, that 1.4% margin of error, they all, they're so close to each other that it's hard to really deduce if there's anything meaningful there. But when we get down the line to a word like community and further down, we start to be outside of that margin of error. And there we see that civic ed is making a difference. People with civic education have lower unfamiliarity than people without civic education. And you see something like a word like civic engagement or civility, um, yeah, it's making a really big difference. Civic education is showing us that there is less unfamiliarity if someone has civic education. So that's that's great news. Another way we think about embracing of civic terms is positivity, how positive our Americans are on these terms. And so here we go again, the 21 terms, uh, people who did not receive or are unsure if they received civic ed are in the orange dot, and then those who answered one of the yeses in the purple dot. Um, and here we also see civic education is making a big difference. Uh, people with civic education were more positive on the whole than people without civic education. Um, and if we look at a word like community or civility, we see it actually made a huge difference. Um, I think that that's really interesting that those are the words that rose to the top. 
Um, we see the only word on this list all the way at the bottom where people with civic education were less positive was um, social justice. Uh, every other case here, we do see civic education, meaning equal, ma making um, an influence in positivity. This was really interesting to us, this cut. This is the positivity on the words that we retested in 2021 and 2023. So I'm going to let this kind of sit on your eyes for a minute because I know we're kind of introducing a third variable here. But if you look down the left side, you see the 11 words that were retested between the two years. And the left bracket here shows us people without civic education and how much more positive they got over two years on the different words. But on the right side, it's people with civic education. And I don't know what your reaction is when you see this, but I would have anticipated maybe an inverse storyline here. We're actually, we're seeing, we know positivity went up overall. Siri already told us that. Positivity went up overall for Americans in two years, which was a surprise to us, but that is what our data supports. But it actually went up more for people without civic education. One of the dri one of the driving groups of the increase in positivity seems to be people without civic education. That is really interesting. And I definitely want to explore that more. Um, the biggest gains were with words like liberty, citizen, and civility. So really interesting, I think, to sit with this. You know, on, on the average, somebody without civic education got 15 percentage points more positive on these terms in two years. And somebody with civic education got nine percentage points more positive. So just a really interesting takeaway. I think something, another another area where we're like, bring us your hypotheses because we want to go into our data and try to see what we can see here. This is definitely an interesting finding for us. So we also wanted to look at, you remember there were five ways that somebody could say yes to that they had civic education. So if somebody had one or two or three or more civic education experiences, let's say they had it in junior high and high school or you know high school and college, did that make them more positive on words? So is more civic education equal more positivity? Do we see a correlation there? And on the whole, yes. We do see that. So this orange line is showing you which group was the most positive of the groups on each word. So most for most of the words we tested, yes, more civic education experiences meant more positivity. Where that wasn't the case, though, um, was a word like American. If you look at that word, we see that people with two or three civic education experiences were a little less positive than people who only had one civic education experience. We also see the same thing play out for citizen and liberty, um, as well as equality, and I thought very interestingly, service. People with two civic education experiences were the most positive on service, even more so than the people who had a third civic education experience. So there's a lot here, and I did see the question come in the chat earlier, and I just want to reiterate, we will send all these slides to you <laughs> as follow-up to this webinar. Uh, I feel like I've been staring at them for a couple of weeks now, and I'm still seeing new things. So for sure, we'll make sure this is all in your hands and you can continue to, to digest. So let's go now into how young people perceive civic terms. Um, we had a question in the survey that just asked people to identify which age bracket they fall into. And you can see those age brackets represented here. I know the font is, is pretty tiny, apologies in advance. Um, the 18 to 24 line is the first line of all of these words. Um, and so we go from youngest to oldest. Um, and I find it easiest to look at this graphic and look for the cascade stories. So are we going, you know, cast, are we, are we going this way? Are we going this way? How, like where, where's the purple line of positivity showing me? And I also kind of like to put my eyes on the, uh, the orange line of negativity. So I start to kind of see what are the cascade formations that are popping out to me. And, um, I think it's really interesting to look at a word, you know, like words like, uh, American and patriotism. Let's look, for example, at patriotism. You see youngest people, that top line, the least positive, the purple line is the shortest, and it kind of follows a line down. It cascades down so that we land in a place where the, the age group that is the most positive is that oldest age group. 
Um, we see that for a lot of these storylines, right? American kind of follows the same way. Citizen kind of follows the same way. But where we see a different storyline is in something like advocacy. We see young people, that first line, kind of holding firm as the most positive. And then we kind of see it regress a bit as people get older. Um, a word like social justice, similar story. Diversity, similar story, where we're seeing the younger groups have higher positivity than some of the older groups. Um, I think unity is a standout for me. If you look at that total bottom one, you see young people pretty high on positivity and pretty low on negativity and, and very low on unfamiliarity. So that feels hopeful to me that young people in our survey were some of the most positive um, and, the, and the most embracing of the term unity. Um, I also think civic engagement is really interesting, where we talk a lot about civic engagement in, especially for youth, in a lot of different contexts, civic education as well, um, not seeing it be quite as effective for young people. That first line in civic engagement, we see a drastic drop off in positivity, particularly compared to other age groups. And that that unfamiliar yellow box is is pretty significant compared to where how little unfamiliarity we're seeing across the board. So I think that's one that also stands out for me in the context of this topic today. Um, here's another interesting one. We wanted to look at the positivity change by age over the two years. So again, I'm going to pause here because I'm we've got three variables moving around here. But the the orange dot that you see in the three brackets here is our 2021 data. The purple dot is our 2023 data. So what we're seeing is how much more positive or not positive did people get over the two years. Um, and what we wanted to see was by these age brackets. So we have that 18 and we did 18 to 34 here, mostly so we can map our 21 data properly. But we have 18 to 34 here. So our youngest group 35 to 54 in the middle, 55 plus on the right. And what we see here is that we know overall, like we said, we know people got more positive on these terms in two years. But again, surprisingly, at least from where I sit, the young people were one of the drivers of that increase in positivity. On average, we saw a 24 percentage increase, percentage point increase for young people in the civic terms. Um, whereas in our oldest group that we're reflecting here, 55 and over, 17 percentage point increase overall. Really interesting. And I think it's also really interesting when you look at that young bracket to the left, the biggest gains were around words like liberty and citizen. And I love that belonging was one of the big areas of gain for young people over two years. Um, so I think just a lot of interesting analysis here um, and I know one of the reasons that folks really leaned on um, this data two years ago was because there's a lot of narrative out there about how unengaged and uninterested young people are in democracy today. So let's just not even worry about them, like really like trying to fight that narrative. And here's a great piece of data around that. You know, I think we are seeing a lot of hopefulness from young people about civic life and civic language as an indicator of that, that I think that gives me a lot of hope too. So for our last area of analysis, um, we wanted to understand the impact to the degree that our data could support understanding the impact that civic education has on civic actions and belief. And like I said, when we were doing our um, design phase, we talked to a few people um, in uh, the civic ed space. And one of the questions that kept coming up is I'm having a hard time having data to demonstrate like the question of like, how do I know, how do I make the case that civic ed has an impact on civic behavior? So investment is key, right? Because it will impact civic actions. It will get people in, in the game. And so we designed our survey to see if we could understand that a little bit more. If you have the survey instrument up, Q9 is where you wanna put your eyes. We asked a question, which of the following actions, if any, have you taken since you turned 18? If you were with us in the last round of research in 21, this question was asked slightly differently. Um, this time we wanted to ask the question, actually, what have you done? Um, in the past, we asked like, what did you think is important? But this is actually like, what have you done? So folks were given 14 options, plus they could have selected none of the above. And 
we were really just asking people to tell us which of these civic things have you done so we could then cut with other things. And one of the things we wanted to cut with was people who had civic ed versus people who did not have civic ed. So orange dot, people who did not have civic ed, purple dot, people who did have civic ed. And I think there's a really clear storyline that civic education, again, makes a difference. We see that people who had civic ed were more engaged in these activities, reported more um, activities completed and, and done since 18 than those without civic ed. Um, the only area where people without civic ed outpaced people with civic ed are the people who selected none of the above, which I think even reinforces the storyline. So people were presented all these options. If they had civic ed, we were seeing people select them at a higher rate. And then there was a bunch of people who said, you know what, none of these things I've done since I've been 18. And people who didn't have civic ed were more likely to pick that than people without. So I think that's really um, interesting here. I also think I would be remiss if I didn't point out the top one here where people with civic ed outpaced people without civic ed the most was discussing, discussing politics uh, with their neighbors. So really great job, civic educators. You're getting people feeling ready and confident and capable of being able to sit down with their neighbors and talk about civic issues. I think that's a huge headline here that I'm really excited to see. So you, this was, oh, hey, did you want to ask a question? Hey, David. I was just going to ask if if you feel pretty good about causality on that last slide, or or could it be that the same people that opt into civic ed are more likely to do those things? Yeah, I think that's a whole area that we need to like dig deeper into. I think this cut of the research, David, is definitely, I would say, like our early signals to know where to dig more. Um, so yeah, I think those are all questions. I also think this is where it's important to remember these are registered voters. So, you know, it's like these, these Americans that filled out our survey are already somewhat activated in a civic way uh, to at least be a, registered to vote. And so that also has an impact here that I think is important to hold. Cool. So, um, the question we asked about civic activities was a select all that apply. So it wasn't just that you let us know that you voted and then you were done. It was like, which of these things have you done? And so what we wanted to track next was with, if you had civic ed, do we see people having selected more options in the things they've done since they were 18 versus the people without civic ed? And here the storyline is really clear too. We see people without civic ed. So that is that orange line, um, mostly in the onesies and twosies family, right? Like we're mostly seeing one or two activities. And then we see this like clear drop off. Um, whereas people with civic ed, we're seeing closer to, I mean, they hit their highest point at three activities. And we see a really nice long tail here. So I'm really encouraged by this as well. Again, what, how do I know if civic ed is making a difference in civic activity? and civic action, like I think this data supports people with civic ed, we see are doing more civic activity. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at like even the seven, eight, eight, nine number, you know, people with civic ed definitely outpacing people without civic ed. So the last uh, thing we're going to show you on civic ed um, is we asked a question because we wanted to get something into the psychology of Americans and how they feel who American democracy is working for. And so we asked this question, who do you think American democracy is currently working for? This was, again, a select all that apply question, or they could have picked none of the above. And this, again, we did a cut of people without civic ed in orange, people with civic ed in purple. And what I think is really interesting here is that people with civic education are more likely to see people different from them. So that's that first line and that third line. They're also more likely to see people similar to them. That's that second line and fourth line as um, who American democracy is working for. Um, I am interested to see that they're dead even on me dead even on me. If you look at that line, who's American democracy working for? The people who selected me who didn't have civic ed equal the ones who did have civic ed. Um, I think that's fascinating. Um, we also see none of the above um, as an interesting note here. This is where we start to see people without civic education outpacing people with civic education in response to that question. 
So I would say here we're like early on in our unpacking of what all this means and like for the project at large and how it relates to civic ed. But we thought this was important to see, um, even if we're still making some sense of it ourselves. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of hopefulness here um, that that people with civic ed are um, seeing that they themselves, American democracy is working for them, people like them and people different from them. So with that, I just wanted to name a couple areas that hit the cutting room floor because I am sure we're going to get a lot of questions about like, could you look into this? Did you look into that? Did you consider this? And the answer to all that is like, I hope someone wants us to do another webinar <laughs> because there's so much more to do in this space alone. And just to give you a flavor of what some of those questions are. So did we see signals that someone's participation in civic education influenced their confidence in civic language? One of the reasons somebody could have selected on why they were positive or negative on the word, which is some of the early data Siri showed us earlier, is that they were confident in the word is why they might have been positive. So we're really interested in like that very kind of pinpointing on that. People with civic ed telling us that they feel more confident in the civic language than people without civic ed. I think that's a fascinating area to look into. Um, you know, we looked at the different ways that people said they had civic ed, some in different level in different um, levels of schooling, but also outside of school. Do we see different perceptions of civic language on classroom based or school based civic ed versus not school based? I think that's a whole area of exploration. Um, which types of civic ed translate to higher positivity for civic terms? Which types? reflect higher familiarity and which types reflect higher negativity. I think that would be interesting to explore. Um, are the reasons why people with civic ed are positive on a term different than why they're negative? And does that differ from people who didn't have civic ed? And then I really wanna get into that definitional analysis for people who took civic ed or had civic ed and those who didn't. Are we seeing different words used to define and describe terms like democracy and civic engagement and racial equity? What does that look like? And what, can, what sense can we make of that? So I just wanted you to know that there is a whole universe that we, even in this even in this sample set, are really excited to be digging into more over the next couple of months. Um, so we do have time for, I think, do we have time? Yes, we have time for like one or two questions. I We anticipated to have more, but I'll tell you what, these, these presentations, we always end up going over because there's so much goodness to go into. But I would take, if anyone has a hand that they want to raise, I'll take the first two hands that I see for question. Or Siri, I don't know if you've been monitoring the chat. There's something in the chat that you want to give voice to. Awesome. Adi, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so eye-opening and really intriguing. I'm wondering about the, the word citizen. Did mm -hmm. you uh, because some people define it with a capital C or a lowercase C? So I'm wondering if the change in it, it was one of the top terms that where there was a very uh, you know wide gap in terms of change I believe if I recall correctly um, and so or a large increase in change and I'm wondering um, perhaps does it relate to um, the questions that are going on related to border security and sit is you know because it could really be interpreted in different ways it could be citizen you know a community member or it could be citizen elite, you know, um, kind of implying a legal status. So I'm wondering if there's um, anything that could have informed that um, finding. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And we don't have, we didn't design the survey to, to tell us much about what people mean in their, like how they define it, except for those three terms at the end, democracy, civic engagement, and racial equity. So we're like citizen, we don't have a peek into. Um, we are considering some qualitative research that might get us an answer to that question, Audie. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, it's like one of the hypotheses that I actually hold for why we saw increase in positivity over two years overall, and, and in this cut too for civic ed, is like, maybe we just got more entrenched. So we're all more positive, but on like our version of citizen 
or our individual version of democracy and not a shared definition. And so I think we have to unpack that more. We we can make some like guesses and hypotheses based on the survey data that we currently have. And we are interested in figuring out how we can go a little bit deeper. But you raise a great a great point. It's like, how are people defining this? And also what's in the what's in the news and media landscape in you know November of 21, November of 23, that might be shifting some of those perceptions as well. Thank you. We have time for another question if anyone has anything that they want to raise or ask or even just a reaction to it. Amy, there's a question in the chat about how we define civic ed, like beyond just the options we had in the question, how PACE as an organization defines civic ed. So you could want to speak to that one. Yeah, um, we we work with, I mean, we are not civic ed experts. Um, we really kind of see ourselves as a philanthropic partner to the civic ed space and trying to help connect funders to the space and the space to funders. Um, so we really rely on our partners to define that. We do think about the dispositions, the knowledge and the networks um, that get people to a place to be engaged in their in their civic life. Um, so that's what I would say to that. And then for the purposes of the survey, like Siri said, um, we we defined it as a, you know, a civics or American government class. We tried to be as specific for the American public as we could be in what they might connect back to in their uh, in their experience. So that was the language we used in the survey itself. Well. Great. Well, so, oh, Ace, let's hear from you before we. Move oh, on. sure. Amy, yeah. this is awesome. I just wanted to do a, you went through this and you definitely probably covered it, uh, but I might have missed it. Um, if you had to say the terminology that is, uh, has the biggest gaps between ideological, the, the ideological divides and one that have the closest, what, what would those be again? I, I think you covered it in a slide. Oh, from a like a political ideology breakdown? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't actually go too hard on it in the civic ed space, but from other analysis we've pulled, um, Siri, help me out here. But the words that were, I know definitely the words that are most polarizing politically are, uh, we see patriotism as a big one. Um, and we see social justice actually a bit outpaced racial equity this time around for us. In 2021, racial equity was, I would say, the word that we saw the most political divide on. And, and in 23, it actually started to become more like social justice. So that was interesting to us and we want to dig into that more. Siri, what would you say are the ones where people are closest? Words like unity and belonging, typically community we saw. Are there others you'd point to, Siri? Mm -hmm. um, no, I think I was just going to say that we also see a divide between democracy and republic on political ideology. So Democrats are more positive on democracy. Republicans are more positive than Democrats on republic. So that's another one where we we're seeing that. Yeah. And Ace, one other thing I'd say to your question that we haven't gone into yet and we're excited to is not only would we be able to see, you know, positivity rates by political ideology, and we can also do it by political party, um, but we'd also be able to see some analysis on that question is, does this term belong to me? Does this, is this word meant for me or someone else? Which I think is a new layer to understanding the political divide. You know, it's like, do people see, you know, do, do people of a particular political ideology see this word as something that they really own and feel empowered to use? Or is that for someone else? Um, so I think there's a lot of new layers that we've given ourselves in this round of the survey to, to look at that question and something we'll, we'll dig into more. Well, cool. great. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Siri to do um, what I hope is, and I know I'm trust will be a very interesting demo of some language stuff. So over to you, Siri. Yeah, great. So with our 21 data and all of the conversations we had with people in the field around it, the question that kept coming up is, well, then, so what should we say? Um, if it's not these terms, then what is it? And so we f really felt like last time we didn't have a great way to, to guide people. We offered some guidance based on some workshops that we held with practitioners, but this time we wanted to really supercharge that question. And so we engage with an organization called Pluralytics and 
I'm going to show you a demo. We asked you in your registration what term you would want to see the demo on and for what audience. And so the top voter vote getter by far was people were interested in the term civic engagement and using that term or speaking about civic engagement to the American public more broadly. So we're going to show you a quick demo on that using the Pluralytics AI platform. This is a proprietary AI tool that helps people communicate more effectively to the audiences they're trying to reach. So I'll show you in just a minute. We're going to put in some content, and then the tool is going to tell us how well that content is doing in terms of reaching the audience that we're trying to reach. And then we're going to look at some of the alternatives that the AI tool generated for us. So that's what we're going to do. We do, I want to say, we're showing this to you. We do have seats available for practitioners as a part of this project. And so if you go to our website, backslash language, there is a button you can push there to take you to a form to request access to the Pluralytics tool. So if it looks exciting and cool and something you would really find useful in your work when I show you kind of just briefly how it works, um, please do let us know that you're interested in using it for yourself. All right, so this chunk of text is something we just pulled right out of, out of the PACE website. We have something called our Civic Engagement Primer, which helps people understand definitionally um, how we think about civic engagement and how to advance it. And so I just pulled a paragraph out of that for the sake of this example. And this is what it is. Um, and now I am going to navigate over to the actual Pluralytics dashboard. So here we go. We are inside the Pluralytics dashboard. We're going to take a look at civic engagement. This is, we'll say, from our website. Um, and you said you're interested in reaching the American public broadly. So we're going to use our bridging benchmark, which is a benchmark that was custom designed for us to be able to check our language as to whether we're communicating with the most broad audience possible. And then we'll just take our top tone. We'll put our paragraph in here and then we will submit it to the tool. So what it's doing is scoring this piece of content against that benchmark and it's going to tell us how well our our paragraph here that we've put in is going to be at reaching the American the American public broadly speaking across many kinds of difference. So this says, nope, this is not aligned with your benchmark. And it's showing us more specifically who this piece of content will reach, people who are achiever oriented. Um, these are pluralytics. Uh, categories. It's not going to be as good at reaching people who are more traditions oriented, more free spirit, etc. So there's all kinds of other analysis. It's going to tell us here about our tone. It's encouraging. It's warm. It's informative. It tells us how complex, etc. Um, and then what we can do is use some of these other tools. This one just tells us, oh, these are our terms from our survey. So our survey is uh, aligned to this resource. And then there's some rewrite tools. It takes a little bit of time for the platform to do the rewrite. So I've done them already, kind of like on a cooking show. And I'm going to show you what this AI tool generated for us. So we asked it to take our content and turn it into a tweet. Um, and so th these are three examples of what the tool wrote for us. Um, and I'm just going to read them out loud because I think they're, they're kind of fun. So the first one is, imagine a world where we all play our part in shaping the communities we love. Civic engagement is not just about building places. It's about building shared values and identities. Hashtag community building. 
The second op, uh, alternative it, it gave us for a tweet was, when we come together with common interests and shared values, we create more than just a community, we create a movement. Civic engagement is the art of making a difference. Hashtag join the movement. And then the third option, the tool generated for us for a tweet about civic engagement is in the orange. Unleash your potential, contribute to your community's growth. Every act of civic engagement strengthens bonds and builds trust. Make your mark, become an active participant, hashtag civic duty. So those are some of the options. Um, you can, in the tool itself, you can say, oh, I like this one, I don't like that one, create more options, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of ways that you can generate tweets or Facebook posts or web page content or all kinds of different things. So we took that and then thinking about, okay, if we're going to talk about civic engagement to the American public more broadly, it's not that we can't use that term, even though Americans aren't as a whole that positive on the term civic engagement. But what's important is the words we put with it. And so some of our takeaways, if we were going to be uh, learning from this AI tool and incorporating it into our communication, is that we want to make sure when we're talking about civic engagement, we're talking about community building, common interests, and shared values. So a, a phrase like come together, bring together in conjunction with civic engagement is really important. Another takeaway that we had is the use of energetic and vivid language, not just kind of academic and technical language, but actually like helping people see that they are invited to take an active role in contributing to something that they already care about. So using terms like create and shape and build with civic engagement would be important. And then the third piece is really emphasizing a positive future um, characterized by growth and building relationships rooted in trust. And so helping people when we're talking about civic engagement, imagine a future that they can help shape that they want to be a part of. So this is just a little snapshot into the power of this tool and the fun that it can be to kind of keep these words that are really important and figure out other language to put around them that will help people connect more positively with the concepts that we're trying to communicate. All right, we have a few other ways that you can keep learning with us. Uh, and so I'm gonna just tell you about a few of those today. The, the next one uh, beyond the Pluralytics tool is that we have a publicly available for free interactive dashboard. And if you go to our website, there's a button there, it'll take you to the sign up for that. It's free, it's 24 seven access. It's got both of our 2021 and 2023 data sets in it. You can look at top lines and cross tabs and there's no limit in there on users or the number of queries that you would do. So please feel free to, to take advantage of this opportunity and share it as widely as possible. One of the things that we value at PACE is making this data available to the people who need it most. And so this is one of the ways in which we are hoping to do that. Another resource that we have available is that you can request specific data visualizations that we will create for you. So we've created a website where you just navigate to it. Again, you can find this on, on our backslash language site. You add a suggestion about what you're hoping to see in a data visualization, and you can give us a little bit of a description around that. And then you can also go in and see what other people are requesting, and you can upvote other people's requests. And then each week, we'll take the top five vote getters and send them over to our data scientist, and he will create the data visualizations, and then we will upload them back into this site so that everybody can see them. So we really encourage you to take advantage of that, especially if you're in the dashboard and it's not 
not everything is in the dashboard. So if something you're looking for is not in the dashboard, um, but you've heard us talk about it today, that would be a great thing to request more specifically on the feature upvote site. And then finally, I wanna mention that we are hosting a webinar series and we are kicking it off with one of our most polarized terms, patriotism. Uh, we're really excited about this. Actually, um, there's a lot of really fascinating nuance as we look at different cuts of the data around patriotism and what's driving people's perceptions around that term. So I highly encourage you to come check out that one with us on April 4th. And then the rest of these are also going to be great. We're going to do a, a specific topic on Gen Z, where we're really looking at all of the, those um, Gen Z age cuts into the data. We're going to do a deep dive into racial equity because there's a lot of interesting dynamics happening there. We're going to do uh, a webinar on rural communities. We had a a handful of oversample partners. And so in addition to our national sample, we have data from Iowa, New Hampshire, Pacific Northwest, rural men, Appalachia, and then the, the rural uh, voters in the Midwest. So we're gonna do a deep dive into what rural voters are saying about these terms. And then we're gonna conclude our series with what we consider to be our power term, the term democracy, and we're really gonna look at that from a lot of different angles too. So please join us for one, two or all of, of those additional webinars. Awesome, thanks Siri. And just one word on the pluralytics um, because I'm in the chat with some folks who are like, this is so scary. <laughs> and I just wanna say like, I get it. Um, one of the things that I feel really encouraged about with the AI tool is there's just lots of different ways to say similar things. And their tagline is, how do we get language out of the way? Like, how do we not get stumbling over the words and really just get to connecting on meaning and values? And so um, one of the examples that our partners at Pluralytics say all the time is like, do you ask somebody to give or do you ask them to donate? Right? It's like, it's the same thing in many ways, but one word's going to appeal to people in a way that another word may not. And so just trying to get sharper about how do we connect what we're trying to do and convey in a way that the words don't get in the way. And one of the humbling things for us at Pace is, is we've been using the tool more for even our own language. We realize, wow, we're saying things in ways that people are not hearing it, right? Like we're using a lot of professional jargon. Um, and, and if we're trying to appeal to groups like Gen Z, if we're trying to appeal to groups like rural, those are some of the benchmarks we've already outlined, or where we're really leaning heavily, if we're trying to appeal to like a bridginess, so like the public uh, uh, more broadly, how would we say it? Would we say give or donate? Would we say, you know, it's like there's there's lots of choices in our words. So just want to kind of name that too, for those of you who may be feeling like, whoa, this is the robots are taking over our language um, and, and just kind of offer that perspective as well. Um, so to wrap us up, uh, just want to thank you all for being here. Um, before you start uh, signing off, I wanted to make sure you did know that these uh, these things are are available to you and these can be some of your next moves. So like Siri said, there is the data dashboard available for you right now. Um, access for free. If you're a first time user, it may take you a couple hours for us to turn around your login info, but just know you'll have it like within a day and you can start to go into the dashboard and navigate around to the questions that you need that is accessible to you through this entire project and certainly through the election. So please use it and please spread to your networks that that is available. Um, go ahead and, and request data visualization, um, vote for others who have requested and we'll start to pump that out and back to you all. Um, let us know if you want a seat for Pluralytics. We can start to accommodate some of those. Um, we'll start to the access in April. So please let us know sooner than later. Um, we'd love if you shared what you learned today. Um, even a, a little stat here or there would be really helpful. We put our handles here. And then I think, Kevin, if you're on this call, my colleague in our comms area, um, we will have something that you can easily repost um, from this webinar. So, so go to our LinkedIn and Twitter and, and do some reposting so that people know that this research is available for them. Um, and then we invite you to keep learning with us. Uh, Siri went over the webinars. The next one for sure is interesting. The should we 
Day Patriotism on April 4th. And then I think this group may be particularly interested in our Gen Z webinar uh, May 1st. Not only is that a, a webinar, but it's also when we will have gone into the data with those particular lenses and have something to share back with, with the world. So um, we're looking forward to doing that. Um, and I just want to close by by thanking Civic Learning Week. Ace, your leadership has been fantastic on this whole week and so grateful to have the opportunity um, to share this research and um, really grateful that the civic ed community has been so um, so embracing of this area of work. I think it's been one of the more gratifying parts of this project is watching how much it's been able to help this community. So please let us know how we can continue to do that. Um, and we're excited to just partner with you on all the civic language ways as we get closer to the election. So thank you all for joining on this Friday afternoon. Let us know if you needed anything related to civic language as we move forward and, and happy Friday.